Hey everybody, welcome back to Reimagining the Internet. My name is Ethan Zuckerman. I am your host here. And I'm really excited about today's conversation with Daniel Pianetti and Charles Braskowski. Um, they are two of the co-founders of Arena. A-R-E dot N-A. They're the two main full-time employees. Daniel is a designer and he's the COO of Arena. He's also a partner at No Plans, a web development studio. Charles is a software engineer, the CEO of Arena. Prior to co-founding Arena, Charles was a practicing artist in New York City. Um, we're going to talk today about this really remarkable platform. And one of the first things we actually have to talk about is what is Arena. My partner asked me who I was interviewing this morning, and I explained that Arena was Pinterest, but significantly less evil. Uh, it turns out that that Charles has actually dedicated a whole channel of Arena to the question of um, how you might describe it. Uh, some of the people have said a social place where people can watch your mental notes, Instagram without the suck, Tumblr graduation, and Pinterest older sibling who moved to Melbourne a few years ago. Um, how do how do you guys uh, explain? what you do every day what what is arena yeah it it really depends on the context but in in a sort of in a very casual setting where i want to get the idea across quickly i usually do lean on pinterest and just say it's pinterest but a little bit nerdier and then i would go on to describe like what one does or what i do specifically which is um on arena you have uh you have two units. One is a block, which is like sort of like a file. It could be an image, a text, uh, a link, um, an, uh, any kind of file. Wait, I said a file. A PDF, uh, YouTube, SoundCloud, anything like that. You can pretty much, anything can, can be represented in a block. Most, most things can be represented in a block. And a channel, which is a collection of blocks. Um, and that's almost the entire rule set. And there's various levels of privacy and people use those two units to sort of organize information, put things into sort of um, put their research into collections, use other people's resources as in their own research and things get uh, cross connected and messy and, and fun. Daniel, as a as a designer in all of this, the the cross connected and messy strikes me as a as a really interesting challenge. One of the things where Arena is extremely different from something like Pinterest is that if I like someone else's channel, I can essentially incorporate it into my own channel. How do you deal with those sorts of questions of control and ownership and you know it's that's a much more collective model than most of us are used to seeing on the web. Yeah, uh, design wise. It's, it's always been a challenge. For example, we do find people who are new to the platform asking, okay, where are the subfolders? Can I create a subfolder? Can I create, uh, because they have this directories uh, mindset. Um, we, do, we do try to explain the horizontality of it and try to focus design-wise on the details and the single actions and to make that as intuitive as they are. But yeah, I will say, especially with onboarding new members, uh, it's always a challenge to get them into the right space and understand, but eventually they they get it. I, I think um, for me, the analogy that, that perhaps comes closest is um, the late lamented Delicious, which uh, was a social bookmarking site um, ended up much of what was uh, wonderful about Delicious has been implemented on Pinboard uh, by Mache uh, Shaglovsky, who we've also sort of had uh, on the show here. This is a model that um, is enormously important for a small number of people, but doesn't seem to have necessarily become a mainstream form of um, organizing information. Charles, any, any thoughts on why this paradigm is hard for people to get their heads around? That's a really good question. And um, yeah, I'm I'm also just side note, uh, I was a big user of Delicious and essentially Delicious shutting down was one of the um, things that, that moved us to, to create Arena. Um, I'm also a big fan of Pinboard. I think the reason why this is hard is... I don't know. It's a good question. It takes a particular kind of mindset where you're you're sort of looking at something that you're seeing and 
you're kind of looking at it in a more active way. Like you're imagining where this piece of information fits into your own world and making that leap from just sort of passively, passively consuming something to deciding um, if this piece of information is important and if so, where it lives in your sort of universe of thought. Um, it's a little bit of a leap, I think. Um, but I think it's something that, it's not something that, that is just like a particular kind of person. I think it's a behavior that can be learned. And I think it's also extremely valuable kind of behavior, especially in an age where there are so many personalized algorithms that are recommending you content all the time. Yeah, so let, let's lean into that for a moment. So one of the ways to describe Arena is um, things that it doesn't have. It doesn't have advertising. It doesn't have an algorithm that drives a feed. It doesn't have an attempt to personalize itself to your own needs. You guys are, are really admirably transparent about the, the financial model and sort of the revenues associated with it. As of this morning, the site has uh, 7,480 premium users who are paying either $5 a month or $45 a year. Um, that contrast pretty sharply to, you know, we've invoked Pinterest a couple of times in this conversation. Um, PayPal just dismissed rumors that they were about to purchase Pinterest for $45 billion. Um, so is is this a sustainable business? And, and maybe more than that, why, why organize it this way? We're at this moment where um, people are paying truly mind-boggling sums of money um, for people organizing themselves in different ways online. And, and you seem to have something that's genuinely useful that people are extraordinarily passionate about, and, and yet um, you've, you failed to, to cash your billion-dollar checks. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think for us, at the very beginning, so we've been running Arena for, or, or Arena has been around for uh, more than 10 years now. And at the beginning, um, when we started talking about it, when it was more of a prototype, we knew that it was going to be in this space where people would be using it to sort of think through their own ideas. Um, and when you, when that is sort of the premise of the business or the, the platform, having a business model that doesn't interfere with that is, you know what I mean? Like advertising can't come into play there because you're, you're thwarting your ability to um, provide that service. Um, so we wanted a very straightforward relationship um, and to have a sort of motivation for ourselves to just make the platform good enough that people are, are willing to pay for it. And for people also to know on the flip side um, that that is the relationship and our role is only as maintainer and stewards and people who are improving the platform and that we're all sort of shaping this fairly amorphous uh, open-ended platform together. I, I think the peace of mind is a big factor because it's a peace of mind for us and for the uh, members, knowing that uh, we don't depend on other people and that the operation can go on uh, in a healthy way. And of course, the first years there wasn't peace of mind because you're worried you're not making enough money to even cover infrastructure cost. Uh, but I think about a year ago, uh, where we finally reached a point where we safely pay for all infrastructures, we start paying ourselves decently, that that was, was a very good moment. And when we also realized we don't need a third party intervention, monetary intervention. So the the project manages to say, sustain itself in terms of infrastructure, in terms of being able to pay both of you is is there is there donated time that keeps it going is there is there sort of community love that keeps it going or is this actually just an example of it is possible to run a sustainable business if you're realistic about the scale that you want to run it at yeah so we have we have um some other people who are working part-time as well um we parts of arena are open source we don't get that many pull requests um but I would say that community love definitely keeps it afloat emotionally. <laughs> um, we have a pretty active community and um, 
We also have an API that people tend uh, are, are kind of using and, and building tools off of. Um, so yeah, it is possible. And, and I think it's probably even more possible now than it was when we started uh, to run something sustainably with, that's like, you know, one or two people can do by themselves. So, so who, who are those users? I mean, you've got, you know, roughly a thousand of them. It sounds like you're, you're paying quite close attention to them. Is there such a thing as, as the average arena user? And, and if so, who, who is she or he? Yeah, I think, I think maybe there's probably like some large slice of the pie are people who are working in creative industries, designers and creative directors and that kind of thing. Um, I think because that kind of information categorization, curation thing is something that comes natural to those people. So it's already something that they're feeling like they want or, or need a tool for, um, but I would say the other portion is really hard to categorize. You know, it's yeah, I think it's more of a kind of like psychographic than it is of a of a demographic. It, you know, it's people who are. I mean, we have this really cheesy term, but we say connected, <laughs> connected knowledge collectors, and I think it's people who are sort of interested in pursuing lots of different disciplines. People who are interested in directing their own learning or education. Arena has a has a free mode where you can have um, up to 200 blocks and channels and then sort of after that you end up paying for it. So it really does make a, a great sense as an educational tool. Um, my student Alexis Hope ran um, a not dissimilar platform called Fold, um, which had some uh, Arena-like features to it. It was much more of a blogging and writing platform. And we saw the same uh, dynamic. We saw classes sort of come and experiment with them. We'd, we'd hope to hold on to a few of them afterwards. Be because there is an open, free version of this, you potentially face the problem that everyone else does, which is the problems of moderation. You know, what, what do you do when... Um, someone creates a really disturbing collection or, you know, someone creates uh, a, a collection of, uh, of of abusive imagery or something along those lines. How does moderation work within the community, Charles? Yeah, so we have a, a set of community guidelines that we feel like is fairly um, reasonable. Um, but thankfully, even in our 10-year history, we haven't had like, I mean, knock on wood, we haven't had really any instances um, where it's been too bad. There, in the case where someone is uploading abusive in imagery, we're like, we take an approach where we're, we're like a, you know, we're like a small library, you know, and we don't have the resources to sort of like um, debate something that, you know what I mean? We're, we would just take it down. Um, and uh, the cases that are, that are, I think, maybe a little bit trickier are ones where, because Arena is sort of a, a research platform, those cases where someone is researching something that might be a sensitive subject. And um, in those cases, we've had people reach out, um, flag a channel, and then we've reached out to the person and, like, you know, just sort of asked for an explanation and then usually it comes to just uh, marking the channel as not safe for work and adding a disclaimer to the description that these are for research and um, the person actually I think they um, were linking to an essay that they were writing also um, so yeah I think yeah we're lucky that it hasn't come up much but I think it will come up more and uh so, so the current approach is essentially, it, it's a library, you're the librarian, um, most things can be settled with a, a quiet conversation with the patron, but at the end of the day, you're not going to get involved with a, a, a long conversation about free speech rights if, um, if something's sort of abusive or, or difficult for other users of the platform? Yeah, yeah, that's most of it. Yeah, that's the policy now. And I think, you know, we're kind of like, our approach is like, we use this guarded metaphor a lot. And I think also in terms of security and protection, you know, you're not like, like 
there's like a, a level at which you step up these sort of precautionary measures. You know what I mean? The first time a deer jumps into your garden, you realize you have to put up a fence. You know what I mean? Like, like we're not going to lock things down until, um, you know, we sort of know it's appropriate. Um, yeah. I know it, it's like, it, it, I feel like I'm hesitating on it because it's a really tricky conversation. It, it is a really tricky conversation. And, um, I, so first of all, I, I, I don't, I don't think you're wrong, right? Like, I think one of the things that interests me about arena is that on the one hand, it, it feels like a community in the sense of there's a lot of quirky people sort of exploring their own form of connection, but I actually like library as a metaphor, right? Where there's yeah. certainly a community around a library, but honestly, most of the time you're in a library, you're pretty quiet and you're doing your own thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm obsessed with questions of community governance, but yours is not the first community that I would, you know, kind of shake by the nape of the neck and say, let your community govern, because <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not sure that, you know, people are using it for such different reasons, that sort of librarian metaphor. Um, may make different things. Do, do you, Dan, do you think of it as a community or, or do you think of it as a tool that a lot of different individuals use? I think the community side of it is uh, the common purpose and trust towards the same goals the community have with us librarians. And I would say trust is a big uh, factor that we want to uh, establish. I mean, we, we, we believe we do have the trust of, of, our, of our community for 10 years. And again, to use again the librarian metaphor, um, the librarian puts rules, but they also need the trust of their, their uh, guests who enter it. So as long as there's this mutual trust, um, there's no um, risk of unbalanced things. Yeah, yeah. And I would say that, like, in terms of our community, where we and the other people who are sort of passionate about uh, this side of arena are super reachable, you know, like anyone can, when you write in to help at arena, like Daniel, Daniel and I are the ones who are answering or my email is like straight on my profile. We have a discord where people can message us directly. You know, we're just, we're around. So that also goes to just a level of trust and being approachable and being able to being around to talk about this stuff. And for the past year, we've been researching ways to include in, in a bit more formal governance way uh, our representation of the community. Uh, we're still working on it, but uh, always with the arena approach, which means very tiny steps. Is the community at all involved with, um, with feature edition or do, do you have people either in that discord or sort of contacting you, asking you for, for new things? How do you, how do you handle that relationship, um, with a community of people who, you know, are, are passionate about this and, and who are directly supporting the tool? Um, how, how do you, how do you handle where they want to see the tool go? Yeah, we're, I mean, yeah, people are, some people are super vocal about the kinds of uh, directions that they want to see Arena go in. And I think the way that we handle that is, like I said, just being available, but also making our plans, like our roadmap is also um, publicly available. We publish uh, investor reports twice a year that we talk about the, the sort of long-term directions that we're going in. So I think... Um, the people who have been involved for a while have a really strong sense of like uh, where where we think we should go, um, and also I think those people have a hand in pushing the, that direction of where we want to go. Um, um, we also have an open channel on Arena that's feedback and feature requests where people will just you know add the features that they want, and sometimes it's something that already exists that the person doesn't know about, and someone else from the community will come in and say, "Actually, you can do this like this," or um, things like that. So, uh, yeah, to get to, to to your original question, uh, people who are super passionate about arena and its direction definitely play a large part in in pushing the direction of of where it goes. 
I'm curious. I we've we've talked a little bit about Pinboard, which is a another small um, user supported company. Um, I'm a member of Metafilter, which is a a larger um, but still relatively small sort of subscription based. I guess it's a one time fee for for Metafilter. Is there a secret community of these, you know, subscription based community supported web services? Y- you know, y'all are a little bit like the Rebel Alliance. You're sort of all rejecting um, the standard model of surveillance capitalism and the potential of, of billions of bucks for um, these very values driven sort of community led projects charles is there a is there a secret bar in brooklyn where you know you, you, you all meet every uh, every third thursday or something i wish there was that seems like a good business idea there's enough people now that there's at least a, a small bar's size worth of of patrons well who, um, who, no. who else is who else is in the space what 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 else should we be paying attention to as far as um uh the indie web if we're going to throw a term on it i'm a i'm a fan of um front porch forum i think i think those people are really cool um there's other ones i mean i think the 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 ones that are interesting like i was i was sort of impressed with Basecamp for a really long time until like their recent moves as a as a corporation um but uh, you know it's that that's interesting that was a that was kind of an anomaly of of a business that grew out of just purely you know straight subscriptions not a ton of i think they had one they had one investor which was jeff bezos which is i mean their whole history is super weird but um yeah they're not a ton i I think there's not a ton to look up to front porch forum is one that i'm like yes they're they're very cool i i'm not sure i'm not sure michael is a uh is a bar sort of guy i think you might have to meet him around uh an outdoor fire pit somewhere in vermont and, and drink apple cider uh, <laughs> we can, we can but uh he, he he's he is also a friend of the show and and someone we we correspond with fairly regularly there there's only one front porch forum in massachusetts and it's in williamstown i'm a, I'm a proud member of it dan wow. what, what about you are there other um sort of indie web friends who who you look at you pay attention to um uh, one thing I see often is uh, initiatives that start within individual, I don't know, individual and develop, developers or s- small group of friends. And those are definitely things that go toward that direction. And, but it's hard to see something that really stays around for a long time and they sometimes evolve into something or maybe this person gets hired by a company and then the project becomes more like a hobby project and then eventually dies so dan that that raises this interesting question which is is why do you think arena has managed to survive for 10 years surely both of you have had great job offers, other projects to work on. There, there's every possibility that this could have been a cool moment in internet history that didn't thrive. I, I think, for instance, my single favorite social networking service of all time uh, was a project incubated at The Atlantic called This, which allowed you to share a single link every day. And if you were subscribed to you know, 50 really cool people, it was the best reading service ever. Uh, but it lasted nine months and then it got yeah. shut down. How, how, how have y'all done this? I, I was thinking about this among those individual projects that eventually get folded. Um, well, for sure, patient was a big element of our success. Um, and yeah, we just kept going. And I think as long as we see interest from our community and people not losing interest in it, uh, we, technically speaking, we have a very low churn rate of uh, paying members. And that's extremely encouraging for us. As, as long as we see the people stay on and they pay for it five years in a row um we know there's something and and keeps it going charles what what about you what do you what do you think is allowed arena to survive for for 10 years yeah i definitely i would agree with that i think it's the people uh the people on it who who keep us going um 
Uh, even at the very beginning when it was, you know, like less than 200 people, there were a handful of those people who saw the potential, were super passionate about it, and being in dialogue with those people is like, you know, being in dialogue with those people and those people bring on their friends and then being in dialogue with those people, I think I think it's it's always the people who 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 keep us motivated. And then I think that the other part of it is just sort of feeling passionate about um, tools for self-directed education on the internet, which feels like they're sort of very lacking at this point. I, I think Pinboard is a really good is a really good example but but a lot of these these things that are about sort of thinking and thinking in public um they just fall either towards this um very performative model where people sort of feel this pressure of of having a lot of eyes on them or they go to being way too private and just on this sort of um tool level where you not you end up not having these dynamics of small communities, and I think being in the middle um, also feels like something to me that that is actually important. Having this sort of public library style uh, platform. That that thinking in public piece is um, something that I sort of miss from the golden age of blogging. Um, mm-hmm. I think we've gone through this transformation where. A lot of bloggers, myself included, became columnists, right? So at yeah. that point, we have to think much more about who's reading us. Uh, there's a lot of people who were writing in public who are now writing privately instead, and it does feel like there's a real loss there. That moment of sort of watching people trying to figure things out, grapple with them, uh, was a really useful moment. We are we do this show because we're trying to figure out other ways the internet could work and sort of imagine the internet working very differently. It feels like Arena has, has at least two imaginations. One is is this, um, this question of an indie web and, and a question of a web built by individuals and small teams rather than by huge corporations. It has this idea of uh, being a web of ideas, of, of people thinking in public instead of sharing these things. Um, Charles, what what should we learn from from you? How does how does Arena help us reimagine the internet, and and how do you reimagine the internet? Well, I think I think from Arena's standpoint, we're like we're not people, you know, we're not like the most amazing engineers or web, or web developers. Um, so I I would say that we try and solve these problems more from. Um, an emotional or a conceptual approach rather than just throwing technology at it. Um, and that's the thing that I think is, is sort of missing in these um, much larger projects, thinking through these things um, just in terms of, of dynamics and in terms of how an individual would feel. Um, I think for us, we're super lucky because, well, lucky in some regards, that Arena's primitives are sort of very relatively few. So any little, any little decision kind of has long lasting implications. Um, but we, yeah, we get to think of those, th- we get to think through those changes from a sort of individual, a personal level. And having that personal connection, I think is, is important to, to building products that feel like um, they are more human, I guess. Dan, how about how about you? When 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 you sort of imagine any sort of transformation of the internet more broadly, um, when when you sort of think about possible futures for this space and in, in which we all live and work, what are some lessons from Arena that you'd like people to take? Um, I like the idea of uh, Arena being a good example of uh, slowness that works, or the right amount of speed um going back to what we said before some projects are too slow and they become uh too small and and forgotten and but most of the projects now tend to or they aim at being extremely performative and big and fast Uh, but there is a way in the middle that creates meaningful products and companies 
And that's something I think it's a big contrast now with, with, with the Web3. The principles and concepts and ideas go towards uh, a, a nice space, but the speed of it and the, the, the frenzy is incredible. And that's, that's, that's a big question. So I, I, I do think Arena is a, is a good example of, of slowness, of healthy slowness. Well, I love I love healthy slowness as a as a, as a place to, to maybe close this morning, um, and uh, first of all, I, I I wish you guys a, another ten years of of healthy slowness and uh, <laughs> watching this sort of thinking in public uh, evolve a really interesting and and quite unique way of expressing people uh, online. Um, they are two of the co-founders of Arena, Daniel Pianetti. Uh, Charles Praskowski. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for being with us today.